science fiction do a dance? The scientists, well, we make a finding. This inspires science fiction writers to write about it, and a host of young people will read the science fiction and hopefully become scientists. I am one of those scientists. Like many 80s kids, I grew up watching some pretty cool sci-fi. I watched The Jetsons and Button Moon. Button Moon was amazing. And I moved on to watching Star Trek and Star Wars, and I admit I had a huge crush on Captain Mal from Firefly. That may have had some impact on why I am where I am. But unlike most kids, and I will admit it, I kind of thought it was real. I thought it was based on real facts, that there was aliens and there was life elsewhere. When I found out this wasn't true, I kind of thought, well, that makes no sense. We are here, so why is there life elsewhere? And so began my journey. I love astrobiology. I love looking for life on other planets. And the one I focus on, as I got introduced focusing on, is Mars. I got into it maybe because it looks so completely different to the Earth, maybe because I loved War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. I don't just look at whether there is life on Mars now. I look at whether there was life on Mars in the past and what there might be on the future. So let me tell you a little bit about my research and what I work on and how I'm trying to find life on this other planet. Well, I'm starting with looking at the Earth. I work with extremophiles. They're organisms that thrive in environments where we as humans could not live. Their, their name literally means extreme lovers. They love environments that are really cold or really icy. They can live under high UV radiation, no oxygen or high levels of CO2. Why do I look at these? Well, Mars is a really extreme planet. Every bit of Mars, these organisms could survive on, whereas we, as humans, would not be able to without artificial help. So is this Mars, four billion years ago, a water world? It was a land covered with lakes and rivers. This is a very habitable environment. Life would have liked living here. It had an atmosphere. It was much denser, which meant this liquid water was stable. Temperatures were much warmer, and it was actually very geologically active. There were volcanoes erupting all over the place, spewing lava and ash. There were impact craters being formed. Meteors and asteroids were hitting the planet. This might not sound like a very habitable environment, but it really, truly was. So, could there have been life living there four billion years ago? And you might be thinking, how on earth does she look for life that existed four billion years ago? Well, I turn to the Earth, and I look at environments on the Earth that mimic those we might have found on ancient Mars. And this is one of my favorites. It looks kind of dull, it's just a river. But it's a river called Rio Tinto in southwestern Spain. It is red, same color as Mars, because it's full of iron oxides and iron sulfates. The best thing about this river is the water. It's really acidic, it has a pH of around 2.3, which is basically like the inside of a lemon or the inside of a lime. But what's great about this water is that it's home to a very special type of extremophile. And that's these guys, the acidophiles, the acid-loving bacteria. They are found thriving in the river waters and in the rocks surrounding them. They are the reason, actually, the water is so acidic. Could it be that acidophiles like this could have existed on Mars? These organisms are coating the base of the river, forming streams and mats of organisms. Could those have existed on Mars? I said before that Mars was geologically active. It had lots of volcanoes. When we find volcanoes, we find hot springs, and we find geysers, and we find mud pots. These exist all over the Earth. In New Zealand, Iceland, which is where these images are from, and me very precariously trying not to fall into a very hot, acidic mud pot. They're found in Bath. And what's best about these is they are home to a very special extremophile as well. But these are called the thermophiles. These are the heat-loving organisms, and they can live in temperatures up to around 121 degrees C. Around these hot springs, we also find polyextremophiles, those that can survive many extremes all at once. The guys in these hot springs can survive acid conditions, heat, and high pressures all at the same time. So if we go to Mars and we look at these volcanic environments, could we potentially find thermophiles around them? But that was Mars in the past. That is not Mars today. Mars today un has undergone a major global climate shift. It lost its atmosphere. Well, it's still got a little atmosphere, but it pretty much lost most of it. That meant that liquid water was no longer stable at its surface, and that meant that temperatures plummeted. It means that this is now the image you have of Mars today, this dirty, dusty, red planet. 
This isn't a very habitable place for life. But I've said these extremophiles are pretty hardy creatures. They can exist in some pretty extreme conditions. So could some of my extremophiles actually live on Mars today? Well, we can try and find that out. And we can go and look at the coldest, driest places on the Earth. And this is the dry valleys in Antarctica. And it is the coldest, driest desert on the planet, not the Sahara in Antarctica. There are organisms that do live here. This place has got low humidity, it's got really high, strong UV radiation, wind speeds of up to 200 miles per hour. So you wouldn't think that life would live in this most Mars-like environment on the Earth. But it does. Life doesn't really live on the surface, however. It's a bit too harsh for that. It actually lives inside the rocks or inside the ice. These green layers you see in these rocks are lichens and cyanobacteria. We call them endoliths inside rock. They use these rocks for protection. They use them for energy. And they use them because these rocks have actually got water inside them, and they can use this water to live. The organisms we find in Antarctica we call psychrophiles. These are the cold-loving extremophiles. And these guys are my favorite because they have proteins inside them that act like antifreeze, so all the water in their cells won't freeze under these conditions. And I heard them rumble when I put this slide up, and I'm sure you guys are all actually looking at the extremely cool creatures that are up here. These are the tardigrades and the nematodes, and these are the hardiest animals on the planet. They can survive extremes of salinity, temperature, desiccation, cold, hot, anything they can, you throw at them, they can survive. The tardigrades, the one on the left, is called a water bear. They've survived space. They've survived the vacuum and the high radiation of the International Space Station. So I mentioned again that Mars was geologically active. When we think about impact craters and volcanoes, the impact crater and volcanoes on the right are from Mars, the ones on the left are from Earth. As you can see, they do look very similar. When you think about these, you must think of them in a very destructive way. Impact craters wiped out the dinosaurs, while the asteroids that created the impact craters wiped out the dinosaurs. Volcanoes cause us a never-ending world of pain. Think 2010 Iceland eruption. That's actually the volcano that I work on. But actually, these environments can create habitats for life. They can give the conditions where life might want to live. Mars today, we're not going to find life living around these areas. The volcanoes on Mars aren't active today. But when we look at these features on the Earth and we look inside the rocks, we find fossils of organisms that did once live in those environments. So the question is, could we look at the rocks around the volcanoes and the impact craters on Mars and we can find evidence of biomarkers or biosignatures, evidence of life that lived in that more habitable time on Mars? So that was the past of Mars and that was the present. What about the future? What does the future hold in store for life on Mars? Well, the future involves us. Permanent human habitation. So the idea of living outside of the Earth is one of science fiction's most prevalent themes. With all the technology advances that we've been witnessing recently, and with us realizing that potentially the Earth can't sustain us and our pop growing population for much longer, the idea of moving to Mars, the Moon, asteroids, or even free-floating space habitats, a bit like the International Space Station, is actually becoming a reality. So could life on Mars in the future actually look a bit like this? With current propulsion technologies, it would take us around six months to get to Mars. And all the logistics and all the technology needed to actually get there pretty much already exists. And thanks to the recent Mars One call for participants, we know there's no end of potentially crazy volunteers who want to go. But when we get there, this is a massive undertaking. We need living space and working space. We need storm cellars to protect us from radiation. We need water, we need food, we need air that we can breathe. And we need fuel, we need energy to power these things. We need transport, we need to be able to move around once we get to Mars. And hopefully, not the Mars One way of doing it, we need some sort of escape strategy, some transport that might be able to actually get us home if this does all actually go a little bit wrong. So these are some fantastic images of what a space habitat could look like on Mars. But it's not that simple. You all must be thinking Mars is a pretty extreme planet. There are a number of things, that we're a number of hurdles we're going to have to get over if we go there. The main one is, 
Mars only has 38% the gravity of the Earth. This isn't really a hurdle to get over, it's more we just have to get on board with it. We would be able to cook on Mars in this amount of gravity. We would be able to walk and move on Mars. We wouldn't bounce like the Moon, and it wouldn't be as easy as on Earth, but we'd be able to do it. The idea of building would actually be quite good with less gravity. We could build larger buildings and they could be bigger. Physically, it'd be quite difficult, though. We would have a lot of problem with the tools and technologies. And the human anatomy, that's the one that we are really worried about, and we don't know what would happen to our anatomy living in a reduced gravity environment. But a number of other things we need to worry about. So we need water. There is no liquid water on Mars. It's ice buried in the surface, so we need to mine it. We'll need protection from the radiation, because there isn't that much atmosphere on Mars. Dust devils and dust storms. These dust devils are basically tornadoes, but they are larger and stronger than the strongest tornado you can imagine on the Earth. So our habitats are going to have to be pretty hardy to try and control and try and save the people that are inside them. We need power, and not just solar power or wind power, because it's not as reliable. We're going to need nuclear power. But what I'm most interested in when it comes to all of this is gardening. Space gardening, astro gardening. The idea of building a greenhouse on Mars, creating an ecosystem that will be able to sustain future colonies. Plants and humans are ideal traveling companions and living companions. We breathe in oxygen and we release CO2. The plants will take up our CO2 and they will give us oxygen. Many of the plants are edible and we can eat them. Our waste material could be used to fertilize the future plant growth. You might be thinking, what plants could we even grow on Mars? Well, if we create a habitat like this, we could pretty much grow anything we want if we make it so it's a terrestrial-like habitat. But there have been experiments to show that we could grow potatoes, sweet potatoes, in Mars analog soil. Oh, and asparagus, that's my favorite. Seeds, we can grow radishes, and we can grow mung beans in a CO2-rich atmosphere, which is just like Mars. So it's a lot to think about. And then there's the ultimate future. Could we? terraform and change Mars to be a bit like the Earth. Terraforming basically means making it like the Earth. Could we make it a habitable environment for terrestrial organisms? How would we do this? Well, there's a number of ideas being thrown around. The main one is to introduce greenhouse gases. We can warm the planet up, make it have a bit more of an atmosphere so liquid water could be present on its surface. This is thousands and thousands of years away. But there are many scientific papers on how this might be done. But let's focus just a little bit more on today. 60 billion. It is estimated today there are 60 billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy, that is our galaxy, that could support life. Our galaxy is one of hundreds of billions of galaxies that exist in the universe. If we're going to throw around those kind of numbers, it seems absolutely crazy to me that there isn't even one example of life other than us that might exist out there. The thing is, we just need to find it and use our tools and technologies we're developing to find it. And then, well, we can finally make science fiction a reality. Thank you.